my name is Dr. Kathy Ng. I'm from Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center, and I was asked today to talk about state of the science uh, treatment for metastatic disease. And um, uh, we're just going to be touching upon a few basic things. And here's my contact information. Um, these are all my disclosures. Um, in regards to metastatic disease, um, I think many of you are aware for first line treatment, we recommend systemic chemotherapy or chemotherapy that would work throughout the whole body um, to address all potential sites of metastatic disease. And then, then the um, second line or um, further lines of therapy, if it's needed, I would uh, recommend uh, immune checkpoint inhibition or immunotherapy. And if possible, we always recommend um, participation in a clinical trial um, whenever available, because that's the way we make um, a difference in um, uh, advances in this um, rare malignancy. Um, so currently we know that um, basically uh, carboplatin and paclitaxel is our preferred first line regimen based upon um, reduced toxicities. Um, and as mentioned earlier, we do recommend immunotherapy as um, a potential option in patients that have received previous therapy for their metastatic disease. We also recommend uh, genomic profiling um, in all patients whenever possible, just in case they do have an actionable mutation. So um, what does genomic profiling mean? It's basically looking for genetic mutations in the tumor tissue. And if that is unavailable, um, we also are available, um, able to look at um, certain um, molecular alterations um, in a, a blood specimen. Um, so that would be tissue versus liquid um, biopsy testing. Um, the reason this is extremely important is ideally we would like to have tumor tissue in order to look for potential alterations um, because with tumor tissue, we do um, have multiple companies which have various panels and that can also look at also um, not only just at mutations, but amplification um, and other uh, ways that we could potentially target the tissue. It also gives you many more options than just a blood sample. Um, most companies, I'm sorry, most hospitals utilize uh, third-party companies in order to get this completed. Um, and then they send it out. And it usually takes anywhere, um, depending upon the company they're working with, it can take anywhere from two weeks to potentially a three, a little over three weeks to get the results back. Um, in regards to treatment, once again, um, for first line treatment, our recommendation off protocol would be chemotherapy. If the patient is a good candidate for chemotherapy, obviously we have to ensure the patient is in overall good health. And that will give you a response rate of about 55 to 60%. Um, in Europe, I, I should mention they do um, add another drug um, to their regimen, um, which has a higher response rate, but it is going to likely impact your immune system and also have more side effects um, than the current standard of care here in the United States. And then once again, immunotherapy, I know everybody wants to utilize immunotherapy because they believe that it doesn't have side effects, but I want to be very clear, immunotherapy has its own side effects and it has a much um, smaller response rate of anywhere between 10 and 20%. Obviously there are some outliers that have had um, dramatic responses to immunotherapy, um, but the majority of patients will have um, a response rate between 10 and 20%, and the duration of uh, progression-free survival or time to tumor growth is about four months um, in patients that receive prior therapy. And this just gives you an idea of the new mechanism of action. So on the left is what's called um, basically uh, immune checkpoint inhibition, where basically on your T cells, you have your program death ligand, um, I'm sorry, your, your PDL one or your program death ligand one on the tumor cell, which one would then um, attach um, with your T cell. Um, and basically this prohibits your immune system from uh, destroying the tumor cell. But with the use of immune checkpoint inhibition or anti-program death one uh, therapy or anti-PDL1 therapy, depending on which kind of drug you're utilizing, this allows um, this to um, uh, your immune system to actually attack the tumor cell and be more um, proactive. A CTLA-4 is a bit more complicated, um, and that would be like ipilimumab, which is a prime example. Um, and basically, um, uh, CTLA-4 um, binds um, uh, 
B7 on your antigen presenting cell and um, through um, utilizing an anti-CTLA-4 antibody such as ipilimumab or other um, novel um, similar uh, drugs from other companies, it allows um, basically your inactive T cell to mature and be able to then um, destroy your tumor cell. So here are the existing immunotherapy agents. Many of you are clearly familiar with nivolumab and pembrolizumab. Those have been around um, since 2017, 2018. Um, and then retifanlumab um, was also evaluated in the metastatic setting as well with very similar response rate of about 10%. Um, atezolizumab is a PDL1 inhibitor. And um, it's hard for me to say, you know, we used to say that they were all interchangeable. I'm not exactly sure. Um, what this means, um, but at atezolizumab, sorry, had two negative trials in um, metastatic squamous cell carcinoma of the anal canal based upon a, a pilot phase uh, two study at MD Anderson, as well as the phase three trial, which I'm going to show you. So what about adopted T-cell therapy? Um, this is really just a um, very unique approach, really kind of taking into account um, how can we utilize our immune system and optimize it and basically we take T cells from the patient. Um, these T cell therapies vary depending upon um, the target and obviously the company and they, so it takes a while for these T cells to grow in the lab. Um, it can be anywhere from um, you know, several weeks to, in, in, in originally when this started out several months, um, I think now this, the system and the way that they capture these T cells um, is much more, uh, it's quicker and, um, much more efficient and obviously not every patient wants to wait so long. Um, but basically then they grow these CAR T cells um, in the lab and then they fuse it back into the patient and the hopes that basically these um, re-engineered T cells are more effective um, to kill the cancer cells. Uh, keep in mind that obviously you are now infusing um, back T cells into your body which have been engineered. And so there's also a high risk of um, side effects um, and, and uh, even something called cytokine release syndrome, um, which can be um, quite uh, dangerous, um, but also um, you, you would be observed um, while you're in the hospital. And this occurs usually in the inpatient setting to prevent any type of allergic uh, reaction. Um, so once again, for early stage disease, we actually have um, several trials that are ongoing, predominantly in the United States. We have two and in, in Germany, there's one called Radiance. Um, and then in metastatic disease, um, I'm gonna really just highlight the phase three studies. I'm not gonna focus on the phase one studies because obviously there's a lot of phase one studies in general. Um, and so EA2182 is currently still enrolling. This is looking at specifically small tumors. So T1 or T2 tumors, so tumors that are less than two centimeters, you know, negative, and patients are randomized in a two to one randomization to the potential of receiving less radiation. So you'll have less toxicities and also only receiving one dose of mitomycin. So as you can guess, with higher doses of radiation therapy, you're also more prone to having more side effects from your radiation treatment, um, such as um, radiation fibrosis, uh, vaginal fibrosis, um, uh, radiation dermatitis, um, uh, bowel issues, um, uh, uh, genital urinary issues as well. Um, and um, sexual dysfunction, et cetera. And mitomycin causes significant myelosuppression or significantly impacts your white blood cell count. Um, so more often than not, we do not end up giving the second dose of mitomycin because most patients' immune system has been compromised and their immune system has not been um, regenerated enough white blood cells in order to be able to maintain the last dose. So it is very common that we withhold the second dose of mitomycin um, because the patient's white blood cell count is inadequate um, at the end of the radiation treatment. Um, more importantly, I think for any patient, regardless if you participate in a clinical trial or not, um, it's extremely important to stay on the schedule for your radiation treatment. Do not have any significant dose delays um, because that actually reduces your risk of benefit from treatment. Um, EH2176 is our phase three trial for newly diagnosed metastatic patients. This is largely based upon uh, prior work um, that also was completed at MD Anderson um, um, when I was there looking at the role of carboplatin and weekly paclitaxel, but also um, the role of nivolumab, which I pre previously published on um, in Lancet Oncology um, in the metastatic refractory setting. So now here's a trial combining 
um, chemotherapy plus immunotherapy um, with the intent of basically um, continuing on the immunotherapy after receiving um, six months of uh, uh, chemotherapy um, as a maintenance regimen. And this is a two to one randomization um, for the possibility of receiving immunotherapy. And then the control arm is standard um, uh, chemotherapy. So there is um, both arms are win-win. The patient does not lose out on anything. Um, this trial is the first phase three trial um, to be supported by the NCI. And also it was actually the first phase three trial uh, open initially. There is a competing pharma sponsored study um, that's largely uh, being completed in the UK with a one-to-one -one randomization. So once again, here's a two-to-one randomization um, that, to increase your likelihood of ending up in the investigational arm with nivolumab. And in addition to that, um, we are collecting HPV circulating tumor DNA because data suggested in um, early stage disease as well as metastatic disease that clearance of HPV circulating tumor DNA um, is associated with response to therapy as well as um, overall survival um, and um, uh, uh, disease-free survival, sorry, progression-free survival or disease-free survival, depending upon which setting you were looking at, whether it's earlier disease. As a result, we have incorporated into our phase three trial in the hopes that this will now be considered a standard of care, um, not only for this regimen in general, um, but as well as for the HPV circulating tumor DNA. So what are the pending trials? Um, EA2165 is a very important study. It's for patients with large tumors or node positive disease um, after the completion of their chemo radiation therapy. Once again, this is a non-metastatic setting. And all of these trials do allow HIV positive patients. Um, patients were randomized to six months of immunotherapy and we are waiting for these results. Uh, hopefully it'll be reported out in the next, um, less than the next two years, I hope. Um, 9673 is an extension of my original uh, trial with nivolumab in the um, setting for patients that have received prior therapy for metastatic disease. This um, was a one-on-one -on -one randomization also with the addition of ipilimumab, so the CTLA-4 inhibitor. Um, and this trial has finished enrollment and we are um, currently assessing the, the results um, and hopefully um, we hope to present these um, results at a future meeting um, uh, next year. Um, I just want you to be aware um, at this year's um, ASCO, um, they presented the data for, for the European trial, um, largely in France, of looking at the DCF regimen. Once again, um, this is the regimen that is a little bit um, going to be a little bit potentially more toxic because it is three drugs. So it's doxotax doxotaxel, cisplatin, and 5 fu um, with the addition of tezolizumab. These are newly diagnosed patients. And uh, one-year progression-free survival was the primary endpoint. And unfortunately, um, despite um, promising activity um, uh, with the uh, consideration of DCF, addition of immunotherapy to this combination um, was not beneficial in regards to progression-free survival. Um, however, I don't want people to believe that um, systemic chemotherapy with platinum and immunotherapy um, should not be carcinoma. I think that trial is an outlier and um, we are still waiting for the final results of that trial to be published. Um, please keep in mind in uh, non-small cell lung carcinoma, and here I show you the swim and cell patients on the left, as well as in cervical cancer, um, we utilize a systemic chemotherapy with platinum and immunotherapy as a standard of care for these patients. Um, and so that is the reason um, you know, we wrote the trial for anal carcinoma several years ago and we were just um, waiting for the original results of Interact to be published, establishing the chemo carbotaxol. And we are also a much uh, a rarer cancer relative to lung cancer and cervical cancer. So obviously enrollment takes a little bit longer, but we hope to establish um, this combination as a standard of care uh, relative um, to other malignancies as well. Um, so um, hopefully you will participate in EA2176. Um, gaps in knowledge, um, obviously, more importantly, still there's a lot of um, mis uh, misdiagnosis and a lack of education. Um, it's not always a hemorrhoid. Obviously, if it doesn't go away, you should have it evaluated. I hear this all the time. And obviously, we, we're trying to reduce our toxicities with um, uh, re reduced exposure with chemotherapy and radiation therapy as in the decreased trial. Um, and we obviously need to now think about treatment options for tumors who have progressed following immunotherapy. There's currently no standard of care in that setting. 
Um, and once again, we highly, highly, highly encourage all anal cancer patients to enroll to clinical trials. That's the way we make advances in this um, disease. And we need to continue to try to advocate for ourselves as investigators and for the patients um, to have pharma companies develop interest in um, anal carcinoma. It is an HPV-associated malignancy. It's a very common um, uh, um, malignancy around the world, probably less than a little less than 30,000 cases, but still it is a common malignancy. And also any breakthroughs in HPV um, associated anal cancer um, can help um, make advances in both head and neck and cervical cancer. So um, last but not least, I'd like to thank and acknowledge um, Michelle Longabau, who is a nurse. Um, she was an author, she was a blogger and was a huge advocate. Um, for uh, uh, the anal rectal task force for the NCI. Um, and unfortunately, um, she um, uh, passed away unexpectedly, um, not due to her cancer, but passed away unexpectedly um, a couple of years ago. And I would like to acknowledge um, her role in really trying to uh, bring support and awareness uh, to anal carcinoma and to not be ashamed of being diagnosed with this malignancy. So thank you so much for your time. And um, uh, thank you for asking me to uh, participate in this summit.